Good afternoon, everyone, to the fourth Renaissance Society Forum of the fall semester. Today's topic is an overview of the propositions on the California ballot. Today's presentation is being recorded and it'll be available for viewing later on the web. If you have questions for our presenters, note that the chat is disabled. Please use Q&A instead. Questions will be taken up at the end of the presentation. Rob Stutzman is a Sacramento-based public affairs consultant. He has previously directed communications for the California Attorney General's Office and was Deputy Chief of Staff for the California Attorney General's, um, I'm sorry, Deputy Chief of Staff for Communications to Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Rob has decades of campaign experience, including five California governor's races. Stephen Mavilio is a Sacramento-based democratic political strategist who has worked on more than a dozen initiative campaigns. His background includes serving as press, assem press secretary to Governor Davis, three speakers of the California Assembly, and former Congressman Vic Fazio. He also served three terms as a legislator in New Hampshire, where he worked on numerous political campaigns. Mr. Mavilio, we'll begin with you. Well, thanks for that nice introduction, and thank you for having me back. Um, this is the third election cycle I've been doing this presentation ever since my mom wrote me into it when she was on the forum committee. And by the way, she texted me a few minutes ago with the advice only a mom could give, Stephen, don't be boring. So mom, I'll do my best and Rob, help me out. Um, each time I've gotten a different Republican to do this with me, and trust me, that's not easy finding a Republican in Sacramento these days, never mind the thoughtful one. Uh, I'm guessing Rob is protected by the Endangered Species Act or something, but I'm happy to have him here today with us. Uh, he's, he and I go back about 20 years, I think, uh, when he worked for Schwarzenegger campaign and I work, was working for Governor Davis and he literally put me on unemployment, but uh, no hard feelings. I didn't change all the Z's on the keyboards that would have made it real difficult to spell Schwarzenegger. And uh, here we are today. Uh, Rob had a tooth pulled this morning, so we'll try not to make this as painful as that experience. But if you hear him talking about how great a President Donald Trump is, you know the drugs have not worn off. <laughs> Just a few housekeeping notes. We do this in a unique way. Uh, we're gonna do our best to keep this even handed, even though we both have pretty strong opinions about all of these. Uh, we're gonna tell you who's for each of these, who's against them, who it impacts, who's donated money, uh, even which newspapers are for it against it. Uh, we're gonna do it uh, on a ping pong basis. Rob will take the even ones and I'll take the odd ones. And we only have about 50 minutes to go through all these and get a few questions from you. So please uh, fasten your seatbelts here because we're gonna whip through a few of them. Um, as you can tell, I talk fast. I'm from New Jersey originally, but the slides will also pop up pretty quick. Uh, we've given you a cheat sheet to go along to take notes. And of course you can download this presentation afterward. Uh, for those of you who are watching this on a uh, recorded version, we're doing this in numerical order. So you can fast forward to the ones that you really wanna focus on or if you don't wanna hear the details of the kidney dialysis measure or something, that would be appropriate time to grab a drink or something. Uh, the one thing we do have going for us is that about four or five of these are brand new. So you may be familiar at least with the concepts of many of them. Uh, for example, Prop 16 undoes what Prop 209 did in 1996. Prop 14 continues funding for a bond measure from 2004. Uh, Prop 21 is a retread from Prop 10 two years ago. But changes have been made to all of these things, so pay attention to the little details we'll tell you about. Uh, we're gonna start with Prop 14, and why Prop 14 and not Prop 1? It's because the Secretary of State puts them in numerical order sequentially from the last election. You may remember in June, you voted on Prop 13, not the famous Prop 13, but one that had to do on school bonds. And by the way, there's a, a move to abolish um, Prop 13 from ever appearing again and retiring it like a, uh, a Magic Johnson basketball jersey or something like that because voters couldn't seem to shake the original version of Prop 13, so that one's gonna go away. Uh, we have a couple polls. Um, why don't we do one of them right now, poll number one to find out a little bit more about how you plan to act on these measures. And while you're doing that, 
uh, we'll talk a little bit more just about some of the atmospherics of this particular election and Rob will join me in commenting some of those. Um, first of all, um, the main question is why are we voting on so many of these things or why are we voting on them again? And the answer to that question is pretty simple. Um, this is a presidential year and in presidential year, uh, progressive advocates and a progressive legislature load up on the things they can put on the ballot because the electorate will be younger and more liberal than it will be in an off year. So that's why you see things um, on this ballot that you probably would not have seen uh, two years ago. Um, you know, Stephen, I'm going to uh, yeah. interrupt you, but we have about 88% yep. of the people have voted and um, I think I'll, we'll close this poll and show you the results. Okay, let's go to that. Okay, so we have some hardcore voters here. 86% of you are gonna vote on everything. 9% are gonna vote on some of them and 5% aren't sure you're gonna vote on any of them. So we have to convince you that it's very important to vote on all of these. Great, so let's go to our first slide then. Uh, did you wanna do the second poll as well or do that later? No, let's, uh, let's go to the second slide, uh, the first slide of the presentation. Okay. And then we'll interrupt that for the second poll. Gotcha. Uh, one more. Sorry. Okay. Let me get over there. That's showing. It's coming in loud and clear. Here you go. So uh, we just talked about the electorate a little bit. Now let's talk about um, why some of these things are in the ballot a little bit more. Uh, we talked about uh, the atmospherics for a progressive electorate, but the legislature also can put things on the ballot. It takes a two thirds vote to do that. As many of you know, the Democrats have a two thirds super majority in the legislature. So they essentially have a get out of jail free card to put anything they want on the ballot. And they have done that with a number of initiatives. Um, that said, it's a lot easier to defeat an initiative to, than to pass one. Uh, the default position of many people, mine, is <laughs> to vote no on anything unless you can be convinced otherwise. And also, some, here's a little fun fact, the, the number of votes for the initiatives on the end of the ballot tend to tail off by about 10% because people just get tired of voting on 12 different initiatives, never mind the local ones. And so if you're in the front end of the ballot, you're probably going to get more votes than the end. Um, some of these initiatives can be 100 pages long. Um, it's not really important to read all those details unless you are well versed in California law. The ballot pamphlet that you got a couple of weeks ago spells out some of the information and allows both sides to make their case. It also includes um, uh, write up from the legislative analyst, which is a nonpartisan independent who talks about how much these things cost and really boils down to what they do. It's probably the only completely nonpartisan independent source. Um, that you can find for these things. I urge you to read those. Uh, even some of the groups that say they're nonpartisan or independent have views on these. So just be careful when you see endorsements uh, because there might be more behind that than uh, you can actually see. Um, finally, some of these things are simply on the ballot because they have a millionaire who's put them on the ballot. We have a couple of those this year. Uh, it costs somewhere around four to five million dollars to just to put a measure on the ballot, depending when you're doing it. And some people, for whatever reason, like to spend their wealth that way. And we can talk about those as we go through them. Uh, let's do that second poll quickly and then we'll jump right into this. The poll. We're asking you here, which of these things are very important to you when you uh, decide how you're going to vote? And there's a list of 10. So take a minute to do that, and then that'll help us taper our conversation a little bit. And when um, you think there's enough time to fill that out, we'll turn it over to Rob to start with Prop 14. Got about 40% of the votes so far. Okay. Still coming in pretty quickly. Looks like it's slowed down. Why don't we go ahead and end that poll? We'll show the results. 
Okay, I'm uh, just gonna read these off quickly. The most popular one seems to be the Secretary of State's Voter Information Guide at 64%. Um, I'll take that back. Uh, actually, the most vital one is finding out who's contributing to or against that, and we'll mention that in this presentation. Um, and then the other ones follow uh, 50 Six percent value their decision based on the impact of state budgets, tax deficit. We have about fifty percent who rely on organizational endorsements, thirty-six percent party endorsements, own research forty-one percent. Uh, the Sacramento Bee is not that influential. Shocker. Thirty-three uh, percent uh, their editorial position on issues, and only three percent say that television, radio, and social media ads influence their decision as, as the most important thing. And twelve percent believe their friends or spouse recommendation make the big difference. Okay, thanks for all that info. And Rob, take it away with Prop 14. We can go to the first slide on that. Great. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, a pleasure to share this time with you this afternoon, and I credit you for your interest and engagement in trying to learn more about these measures, which are never uh, always all that easy to understand. And it's also a pleasure to be here with my, my friend, Steve. Uh, in spite of what you may see on television, hopefully you'll come away realizing that there are indeed uh, friendships across the aisle and many years of maybe professional parry back and forth, but at the end of the day, um, we, we both care deeply about our state and respect one another very much and what we do to try to improve the state of California. So first ballot measure, Proposition 14. Steve alluded to this a bit of a moment ago. It's, it's not so much a redo, but a re-upping on something that you all voted on uh, if you were voting in 2004, which was two things. One, a $3 billion bond issue, but then also creating uh, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. So it was basically taking state bond money and allowing it to be given out in grants for stem cell research through this organization that was also created by the 2004 ballot measure. Basically, the $3 billion has, has run its course. And so this is a measure that would ask voters to issue a new set of bonds, this time 5.5 billion uh, in general obligation, meaning ta taxpayers will pay it. There's no revenue theory for it, um, but it would refresh the, the well, if you will, for grants to be made in the future. Next slide. So the, the arguments for is that it will continue the, the vital work of stem cell research uh, that has taken place. Uh, you can see there 1.5 has been used on age-related research regarding Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, and other things. Uh, I also, it's not noted here, but would, would I add, it has also drawn uh, research uh, to California, entities that have come here to use this money uh, in the state. Next slide. And the arguments against it. Uh, maybe what you would you would assume that there's other research being funded uh, primarily by the federal government, not necessarily a role for the state. And of course, anytime there's a bond measure on the ballot, as there was in March, uh, whether or not California should add this to their debt is a consideration. Next slide. The supporters, uh, Mr. Klein, Robert Klein was one of the original supporters and instigators of the 2004 ballot measure. Uh, he is, uh, has a very deep pocket on this issue. He has contributed uh, millions of dollars to the, to the issue back in 2004 and, and again is this year. And then some of the other names you see there probably wouldn't surprise you. Medical groups that would, are advocates for, for uh, disease research. Uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, for instance, would probably be familiar, obviously related to Parkinson's. Next slide. No organized opposition, meaning that there is not a political committee that has been uh, filed with the Secretary of State. There's no money being raised and no money being spent at this time against this measure. But there is opposition, uh, predictably California Republican Party and anti-tax groups. Now to Steve and number 15. Okay, this is one of the big kahunas on the ballot this year, Prop 15. 
Uh, never before since 1978 when Prop 13 was put on the ballot and passed has anyone attempted to try to pick away at that and this is what Prop 15 does. This applies exclusively to commercial property, does nothing to do with homeowners, and it only applies to properties valued at more than $3 million, which is only about 10% of commercial properties. Specific exemptions in Prop 15 uh, as noted on the slide. Uh, and the reason it's on the ballot and it's put on the ballot is because it generates a bunch of revenue, up to $12 billion uh, for schools and local government. I think about 40% goes to schools, including community colleges, and the rest would go to local government. Next slide, please. So there it is again. Uh, why this is on the ballot is because schools need money. There really hasn't been a massive infusion for a long time. And this is seen as the answer to do that by a lot of people in the education world uh, and to the local government world. Uh, Prop 13 specifically exempted, uh, specifically uh, included a business. A lot of people said it shouldn't have been since it was sort of billed as something to provide homeowner tax relief, but this one would chip away at that and carve out these large commercial properties. And the people that want to do that say, well, they're not paying their fair share anyway. Uh, the first step to bringing uh, tax fairness back is to do it this way by attacking the larger corporations. Next slide. And as you might expect, people that don't want to pay more taxes have lots of good arguments for them not to do that. First of all, it, it basically they will undermine Prop 13, the, the camel's nose under the tent uh, phenomena of once you do this, homeowners will be next. Um, it is, in fact, one of the largest tax increases in California history. Um, the big corporations say, hey, we're not paying these taxes. We're going to pass these on to you little guys. So you'll see lots of ads for small farmers and restaurants and other ones uh, saying they're against it for that reason. And then lastly, uh, they say that it spurs the exodus of business from California. It makes it more hostile to do business here and more expensive. Next slide. Uh, and there you see the supporters. Uh, ranges everywhere from the governor to the Democratic Party. Um, most of the labor unions are putting the money behind the CTA, the California Teachers Association being the largest one. Um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have even weighed in on this one. They're for it. Uh, our mayor, Sacramento Steinberg, is for it. Uh, and some of the more progressive fringes of the Democratic Party, including the Democratic Socialists and the California nurses, are also on board with this. Uh, the reason is more money for local government and schools. Next slide. And predictably on the other side are more your fiscal responsibility groups, including the business groups of the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable, the California Republican Party, Howard Jarvis, um, Patrick Mulvaney, who owns a restaurant here in Sacramento is against it. And I threw on these two other little ones just to show you the depth of which opponents go to to find groups that will oppose these. Um, probably not all that influential to anybody in this broadcast, but they're there. Um, Steve, if I could slide. add, a, before we yep. leave Prop 15, because I think you and I would probably agree this might be the most consequential measure on the ballot. So just a, a little bit more, well, just, just some additional context. This is a fight that has been years in the making. As Steve indicated, it's the first time since Prop 13 passed that there is uh, something on the ballot to actually alter it. So this is a this could be a big moment uh, for the future of, of taxation in in the state, and I know from the business community side, the funding against it hasn't been as robust because of the COVID recession has particularly hurt uh, commercial property owners. So there's not as much money against this. There's a lot of money against it, but not as much as had been originally predicted. But the business community wants to beat this badly so it doesn't come back again uh, for a long time. So this will be, you'll hear a lot about this leading up to the election. It'll be a pretty interesting one to watch on election night. Yeah, there's been a couple polls. It seems to be doing okay, about 50%. Uh, in favor, 38% against. Um, but, you know, that's not... You know, in polling, it looks like it's ahead, but again, that default position is no for undecided voters, and it's up to the no campaigns on all these measures to raise doubts. So that number may change, but it is ahead right now. 
Okay, next slide. So Proposition 16, uh, Steve mentioned this one in his opening remarks as well, because this essentially undoes Prop 209, uh, which was passed in, Steve, you might need to help me here. I want to say 96. I, I believe that's the case, that's yes. about right. We're old enough that we should remember we were there. It uh, is, 1996. <laughs> so Prop 209 was passed by the voters, which prohibited affirmative action uh, by the state. This has been put on the uh, ballot by the legislature to essentially repeal that constitutional ban. And what it would then allow, uh, would allow the legislature and the governor to then put into place affirmative action policies if they'd see fit. And of course they will, that's, that's why they placed it on the ballot. Slide. So uh, the arguments for, as you can see there, is that it's time to level a playing field for the state to consider race and gender uh, without quotas, but when making decisions about contracts, hiring, education, uh, and this is all to be done to eliminate systemic uh, discrimination. Uh, California, they say, is out of step with the nation on ensuring equal opportunity. One of uh, only eight states that don't allow some type of affirmative action in hiring, contracting, or accepting students. Next slide. And arguments against, as you often hear, again, against any type of affirmative action, that everyone should be treated equally. This does create some type of preferential treatment, possibly in a institute in, in, inside government. Um, and that we already have affirmative action based on income for uh, con contracts and uh, admission. Yeah. yeah. Asian American students, they argue, would be affected particularly on, on college admissions. This actually has been an issue in the legislature between the African American caucus, the Black caucus, and the Asian uh, and Pacific Islander caucus. So it has been a bit of a racial clash for several years, but there has been reconciliation on it this year, and they came together to actually go ahead and place this on the ballot. Slide. See who here who is in, in favor of both of our senators, the governor, uh, the UC Board of Regents has endorsed Congressman Matsui, which I think is significant given the dynamics I just described. Uh, and of course, it's California Democratic Party. Slide. And opposing it is the Republican Party, some Asian American organizations. Uh, Professor Tom Campbell is also a former congressman from the Bay Area who's run for for uh, the U.S. Senate in the past, and Ward Connerly. Ward is the, uh, the African-American gentleman that worked with Pete Wilson and was the original sponsor of the initiative in, 19, in 209 back in 1996. So he, of course, opposes this because it would be overturning uh, the campaign that he led uh, in the 90s. Just one not comment on that. This one is oddly, I think surprisingly to a lot of people, trailing pretty badly in the polls, yeah, even yeah. among Democrats. Um, and I think a lot of people thought, given the atmosphere right now uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement, this would be skating through, but not the case. There's not a funded campaign against it, really. Uh, it's pretty small. And the Yes campaign doesn't have a lot of money either, because I thought they think it was going to be so popular. But you will see a lot of people pouring some money into this based on those early polling results. Okay, next one. Okay, here's an interesting one. This was also put on by the legislature, largely uh, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement as well. Uh, right now in California, California, if you've committed a felony, you have a right to vote, but only after your parole is completed. Um, this would essentially give people on parole the right to vote. Uh, that's about 40,000 people in the state. Uh, we would not be pioneering in this. We'd be number 18 if it passes. Next slide. And the folks who want this to pass say that, hey, listen, they've completed their sentence in prison. Now they're back in our community. They can contribute to society. I'll let them vote. The studies have shown that if you give folks voting rights, they integrate better into the community. And once again, they'd say that because so many more people of color are in prison, this affects them disproportionately. Next slide. 
the opponents say, well, wait a minute, they really haven't finished their entire sentence because they're still on parole. Um, so why should people that haven't completed their entire sentence be given the right to vote? And uh, that is their main argument. Next slide. Uh, this was actually proposed by our assembly member here from Sacramento, Kevin McCarty. Uh, the governor supports this, the league supports this, uh, Democratic Party, um, well, it's California Association of Counties because there's some uh, money savings. Um, but you can see the, the supporters are, are quite predictable. It's largely uh, middle and left of center groups. Next one. The uh, opposition to this, which is not really well funded or organized, but exists. The ballot pamphlet arguments were signed by a number of crime victims groups. Uh, Republicans are against it. Senator Nielsen, who represents Carmichael in some communities in Sacramento County, also as a strong opponent of this measure. Okay, 18. Prop 18. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, this is one of those ones you can read the title and summary and understand it. Simply put, they, this would lower the voting age uh, to 17 uh, in the, uh, for the primary of a year that they may turn 18. So the argument is, as you can see there, that there's already 17, or um, half the states allow 17 year olds to vote in the primaries of the year that they would be turning 18 in the general election. This was put on the ballot by the legislature kind of an interesting generational story. Assemblyman Kevin Mullen from South San Francisco, this has been one of his pet projects and he was able to achieve getting his, uh, his colleagues to agree to put this on the ballot for this year. But it's really an effort that began a generation ago when his father, Gene Mullen, uh, was in the legislature before, before him. Slide. Arguments for it, expands voter rights, allows younger people to get more involved in elections, particularly in a year where they will become general election voters already, will boost civic engagement, uh, and result in a higher percentage of younger voters participating in the process. Slide. Arguments against, 17 year olds aren't 18. Uh, there's concern, I think, for more conservative organizations that there's a captive audience uh, of 17 year olds in schools that may not get all sides of all arguments. Many tax measures are decided in primary elections. And so this would essentially expand the, uh, the electorate with what was, would probably be a more liberal um, uh, electorate, or at least, you know, not one of taxpayers, although some 17 year olds, if industrious may be, but don't, not, don't necessarily have the, the perspective of most taxpayers. Uh, and there'd be some increased state and local costs for new voters. Slide. So supporting is somewhat what you would suspect. California Democratic Party, uh, our uh, Secretary of State, uh, Alex Padilla is in support, the governor, and then you see um, the California Labor Fed, which, Business groups would say, aha, there it is. Uh, labor may be wanting to expand the potential for, for raising taxes and primaries. Next slide. Opponents, uh, again, nothing organized, meaning there's not a political committee against us, so no official political campaign, but the opponents are primarily for those tax concerns, California Republican Party, Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, and I would say probably a lot of parents who have had 17 year olds. <laughs> Next. Okay, 19, this one should have everybody on the edge of their seats in the Renaissance Society. Uh, this has to do with a property tax for change for older adults. It's been put on the ballot by our wonderful folks in the legislature, prodded by the real estate industry. Uh, essentially, this would allow you to take your existing Prop 13 property tax bill and move anywhere in the state rather than just the county. Uh, it closes something known as the Lebowski loophole. Uh, this has happened when actor Jeff Bridges inherited some property from his parents or grandparents and rented it out. And he was getting an enormous tax break, even though he wasn't living there. So this would make uh, a, a requirement that you have to live on this property that you inherit to get that same Prop 13 tax benefit. 
As a sweetener, they threw in that the money raised from this will be used in a special fund for fighting wildfires, which seems to be pretty timely right about now. And it is a complicated uh, initiative, but I tried to wrap it up there in short order. Uh, let's go to the next slide, explain a little more. So uh, I think everybody's familiar with this first one. A lot of people seem to be locked in their homes because they don't want to sell them because they'll lose the uh, low property taxes they have. Um, older adults generally live in a property for a real long time. And when they move, they're faced with a significant tax hike. And this would guarantee you could take it with you. Um, it el eliminates that tax loophole I was telling you about that allows um, grandchildren and children to inherit properties without living there. Uh, proponents say it's going to put a lot more housing on the market because people will now be able to move. And given what little housing is available on the market now, that would be a good thing for a lot of people. And the firefighters signed the ballot argument as well because of the potential, according to the LAO, of getting hundreds of million dollars for fighting wildfires. Next slide. There's really not a lot of opposition to this, but those who make the points against it say it's gonna benefit the real estate industry. Think of all those great commissions that realtors will be getting from selling all those houses and people buying them. Um, they also say that, listen, you know, people have bought and held property because they wanted to give it to their children and grandchildren as their second home or cabin or something like that. And this will stop them from doing that. Um, overall, the net increase is gonna be about $2 billion. That's a lot of cash. And again, people who are opposed to any kind of tax hike might not like that at all. Uh, let's go to the next slide to see who's for this. Okay, now we have a little different kind of scenario where it's not just liberal groups versus conservative groups. You have the realtors on the same side as the Democratic Party. You have business groups on the same side as the Democratic Party. You have the forestry folks concerned about um, fire and wildfires in there along with the firefighters. The Farm Bureau thinks this is a good idea. And the governor has weighed in on this one. He's only weighed in on a few, and this is the one he's urging a yes vote. No side. Again, not a lot of opposition. Um, Howard Jarvis is opposed to it because of that elimination of that ground children's loophole, let's call it. Um, but other than that, there's really been no money spent against it. Really not a lot for it. Uh, I think people are figuring this will prevail on its merits. Steve, a couple of comments on this. Comments. The, uh, it, it's interesting, maybe a quick lesson here on how some of these come together, an observation is you saw, Steve mentioned that the California firefighters were in support of it. And if you've seen, there, there have been a couple of ads that have begun to air, funded by the realtors, but they feature a fireman. And so sometimes when these uh, initiatives are being put together, you do them in such a way as to draw in the type of allies that you want and want to feature in the campaign arguments. So they wrote this in such a way, the realtors did, to make sure funding went to firefighters, thus the firefighter uh, unions come on board, and now you've got ads with firemen in them, which for the realtors turned out to be rather fortuitous given how prominent firefighters are to us after this summer of disastrous fires. So interesting how these things don't all necessarily happen by accident. Um, there's a lot of intention behind them all. Yeah, in fact, this one is a little bit like something that was on the ballot just two years ago that the realtors put on. Um, and then they poll tested it and found that people didn't like the potential revenue loss, the cities and counties in particular, from taking your old tax bill to a uh, another property and they actually didn't spend a dime on it after they qualified it after spending millions to put it on the ballot just let it die so um, this is, has a little sweetener on it as Rob mentioned and probably the prospects of passage are good yep. next slide okay prop 20 this is our law this is our one of our criminal justice issues on the ballot let me kind of walk through what's going on here You'll recall on two different occasions in the last decade during Governor Brown's years, there were Proposition 47 and 57 on the ballot, which had to do with criminal justice reform. You can see they're downgrading certain drug and property crimes to misdemeanors uh, and making it easier for some offenders to attain parole. This is one of the primary reasons why we have a declining 
population in our state prisons. If you're watching the news today, you may have seen that Governor Newsom announced the closure of a, of a prison. And I know that he wants to close at least uh, one more in the year that's ahead. So these measures, 47 and 57, which both passed, have had a lot to do with putting us on this trajectory of fewer people uh, in prison, spending more on parole and probation. So this <clears throat> would change some of that. This brings some of those, increases some of the penalties, particularly for theft-related crimes, because we've seen an increase in those crimes. Changes how people be released from prison and supervised once they're back out in the community. Uh, make some changes to the process created by 57 um, on how to consider when you can release an inmate and then requires uh, state and local uh, enforcement to collect DNA uh, adults, uh, from adults convicted of certain crimes. Now, we all know, if we, particularly as we've watched uh, crime being solved here in Sacramento Valley in the last couple of years, is that DNA has become a, a huge asset to law enforcement and being able to close cases, particularly cold ones. Next slide. So the arguments for it, well, the arguments for it are the proponents will say that crime has increased and it closes certain loopholes in order to get a little bit tougher on crime, particularly property crimes. 20 nonviolent crimes, including assault with a deadly weapon, child sex trafficking, need to be reclassified. You see the, in quotes there, nonviolent crimes. Proponents would argue there's violent crimes that have been classified as nonviolent. Uh, by these measures, so they want they want to uh, to try to address that, and they argue that we, you, they want to strengthen sanctions um, against serial theft. That's why you'll see here in a moment that there are grocers and retailers in support of this because they have seen as 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 uh, grand theft was revised down, they have seen uh, shoplifters, for instance, become very familiar with where the limits are of how much value they can be stealing. Uh, and still stay below that, that grand theft threshold. Next slide. Uh, the arguments against is that it's taking us backwards in criminal justice reform at a time when there seems to be a commitment, at least in a state like California, of continue, continuing to be progressive on criminal justice. It will increase prison spending by tens of millions of dollars, uh, disproportionately affects minorities, and gives uh, less leeway and judgment to parole boards on making their own decisions on how to release people based on an individual basis. Next slide. Who's in support? Pretty much who you would expect, you know, law enforcement, the crime victims groups, uh, California Republican Party, and then you'll note there uh, of local interest, Assemblyman Jim Cooper, uh, who's a former undersheriff of Sacramento County, not only supports the measure, but really spearheaded the effort uh, to organize this campaign and get the signatures for it to get it on the ballot. He's, he's, he's truly a, a, a leader, if not author, of, of the measure. Next slide. Next slide. Opponents, well, Jerry Brown doesn't really appreciate that they're trying to undo something he was so passionate about and raised money and, and ran campaigns to, uh, to pass on 46 and 56. So the governor, from his uh, retirement in home in Calusa, has put a little bit of leftover money he's had into this uh, measure to oppose it. So he's helping fund some of the opposition. Uh, Billion bucks. Yeah, yeah, and then you see Democrat Party, um, some labor opposition, ACLU opposes, as well as the pro the probation chiefs. Next slide. I guess we're on the twenty one. 
Okay, we're moving on to 21 and we're running out of time, so we're gonna have to go a little faster. Okay, this is a full disclosure. I am working on the No on 21 campaign, yet I will try to be as even-handed as possible. Um, if you think you've seen this one before, you have just two years ago, it lost by nearly 20 points every county in the state except for San Francisco. Essentially, it allows communities to enact tougher rent control, uh, including some single family homes that if your home is in a trust or in a state, it would be included. Um, the tweak on this is that exempts new properties for 15 years, and it, it tweaked it to only allow those single family homes that are held in a trust. And if you own more than two properties, then you also are subject to rent control or are allowing a city to do that. Next. So the advocates of this say, well, you know what? The rent is too damn high. We got to do something to stop the increase in rents. Uh, they also say it doesn't naturally impose rent control, but it allows communities to do that. And essentially people that are living in their homes and getting priced out will be able to stay in them because there'll be a cap on how much more rent they'll pay. Next. The opponents uh, say, well, you know, it's a great deal if you're never gonna move again, but it's gonna make the housing crisis a lot worse because no more people are gonna build new housing because it won't pencil out for them. Um, the governor this year, between the last prop and this one, signed the strongest renter protection law in the whole country. Uh, he says that ought to work for us before we do this. Um, it also creates a lot of rent control boards at the local level where it's are expensive. Um, the LAO, the fiscal watchdog, says it'll cost tens of millions of dollars for new costs because property values will go down under rent control. And that means less revenue will be able to be given to our local governments and to schools. And then a lot of people just take their homes out of the market if they go under rent control because they don't want to deal with the bureaucracy every time they need a new roof or something. So that would take a lot of houses off the market. Next. The YES campaign is funded by one entity. It's the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, a guy named Michael Weinstein. That name may sound familiar. He's a serial initiative filer, as we call him. He had put an initiative for uh, requiring condoms for porn actors a few years ago, and then another one of prescription drugs. Uh, he has a hobby of engaging in elections, and he's spending his money, $22 million so far, on this. Uh, it has a complete uh, left uh, of center support base, the Democratic Party, Al Sharpton, Bernie Sanders, uh, and Dolores Huerta, that element of the Democratic Party and the progressive left is all in favor of this. Um, next slide. The no campaign is um, a little broader, I'd say. Um, the governor opposes this. The governor and the Republican Party oppose this, and they don't agree on much these days. This is one thing they agree on. You have some senior groups opposed, some labor unions, the building trades, people that build housings. Most of the funding is coming from landlord groups. Um, it has been editorialized by 23 of the 24 major papers in the California have said no, including the Sacramento Bee. And it is polling at 3737 in a poll released by UC Berkeley yesterday. Next. All right, Prop 22, this is what you will see the most advertising about because it's already been on for a couple months. This has to do with employee classifications. Just to set the scene, you may be aware that there was a California Supreme Court decision called the Dynamex decision, which narrowly defined what an independent contract worker can be. That decision was then largely codified, put into law by the state legislature uh, almost a couple years ago now, that was AB5. So you'll read a lot about AB5. What the labor unions really wanted to do was target particularly these the gig economy, Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash. And so after negotiations broke down on how to come to some agreement, Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash have put this Prop 22 on the ballot for this November. Uh, they think they, they, they are giving some concessions, so they are going to guarantee some type of minimum wage based on driving time. They're going to give some type of stipend towards health insurance, uh, compensation for on-job injuries, uh, but they want to stay away from the strict regulatory uh, uh, structure of actually classifying their drivers as employees. Uh, and they're trying to close off the path to unionization here too. Next slide. 
So this is what you're going to actually have been already probably seeing on, on your TV screens. It will preserve the model for the app-based services that rely on independent contractors. And in this time of COVID, uh, probably consumers have become more reliant upon. Um, the, the app drivers enjoy flexibility. Uh, as part of their part-time work, only 15% are full-time. You'll see a lot of that in the personal stories they're telling through their ads. Doesn't really affect that many uh, people, they argue. And they have put one of those sweeteners in, adding a strong background check uh, and protections for the t passengers that would then be getting into the cars. Actually puts in the law uh, a tougher requirements than what they need to do on background checks. Next slide. Arguments against, well, it only exempts these certain companies, or at least companies like them. Uh, it, these are companies that exploit workers. They don't offer enough benefits, which would, they would be getting if they were actually employees, and would allow the companies to basically circumvent overtime and minimum wage laws. Next slide. In support, Lyft, Uber, DoorDash, Postmate, Instacart, pretty much anyone you have on your phone uh, that provides these type of services supports this measure. Lyft and Uber to the tune of $180 million. That's how much money they have put into the campaign. Uh, I don't know if they'll be putting more in. That would be historic, but $180 million is what they're uh, spending to try to pass this, this measure. Also supported by the police chiefs, because we have that tougher background check in there now. Uh, Black Lives Matter Sacramento. Um, which I don't know how to explain, maybe Steve could, and then Senior Advocates League supports as well. Next slide. And pretty much the opponents is labor and Democrat politicians in the Democrat Party. This is a big fight for, uh, for business versus labor. Yeah, this, this is it. This is labor putting all on the line for this one. All right, next one. Okay, we got three more in only a few minutes, so we're gonna have to race through. This one uh, you've seen before two years ago, uh, has to do with kidney dialysis. Uh, I'm not sure what voters are doing deciding on this on the ballot, but here it is. Uh, lost by 20 points last time. It has, it's basically sets up more requirements for the companies that have these dialysis clinics in the state, which is essentially two companies. Uh, this is part of a long running battle between labor unions and this company. And that's why it's back on the ballot again this year as a negotiating tool, I think more than anything else. Um, you can see some of the actual uh, requirements of here, it requires doctors, uh, has some protections for low income, um, things like that. Next slide. Again, this is a, more or less the broad side on the kidney dialysis industry. Um, there have been incidences and some concerns about the quality of care. The proposition attempts to try to tighten some of those by some of the provisions here. Next slide. And the folks that are against this, which is again, the kidney dialysis companies who are spending, and I think spent the record amount during the last election. Um, they say, hey, wait a minute, we're regulated by every which way and every which agency, so we don't need this. It'll cause cost increase. And this is just a union pressure tactic. Next slide. Supporters are just who I said they were. Uh, SEIU, uh, United Healthcare Workers, is primarily funding this. It's supported by other labor groups and some other good government and religious groups. Up next slide. Uh, what a surprise that kidney dialysis companies are against it. Um, but also so is the CMA, the Medical Association, that's the doctors and the nurses, veterans groups, and the National Kidney Foundation. Uh, you can read the ballot argument on this one. It pretty much sums up um, each side and gives you more time than I can do it right now. Next slide. All right, Proposition 24, home stretch. Steve mentioned wealthy people spending money to put things on the ballot. Well, this is an example of that uh, a gentleman named Alistair McTaggart, who's a wealthy uh, real estate developer from the Bay Area, has taken um, consumer privacy up as his pet cause. Uh, he actually qualified a measure for the last election, but withdrew it after negotiating a, a settlement or a deal with the legislature. But he's back with this, pushing for 
more consumer privacy. So you can see what it does there, uh, allows companies, um, allows consumers that order companies not to share data, uh, triples fines for using children's data, establishes a state agency, so it creates a, creates a new state office, some would call that new state bureaucracy, uh, to enforce these privacy laws and, and make sure that financial penalties are, are increased and uh, administered to violators. Next slide. Arguments for it, Mr. McTaggart says, well, it cracks down on the sale and sharing of that personal information beyond already what's restricted under state law, allows you to really take control of your data and let companies stop tracking your location, establishes this new state agency, and limits what the legislature can do to weaken precautions. It's actually an important point, just real quick. This will pretty much lock in a privacy scheme and the legislature won't be able to to alter it. They'd have to come back to the ballot to ever do so. Next slide. Arguments against, written behind closed doors. Where's the legislature? There's been no public debate. Very complicated issue that hasn't really been aired out in the way this is brought together. 52 pages of exemptions. It's confusing, including weakening some protections. Um, a pay for privacy scheme is what they allege. And um, you can get more ads and slower internet connection unless you pay uh, to get uh, to get rid of the ads. Billions in compliance costs, $10 million annually because there's your new state agency. Now the next two slides might be surprising. Keep going. So yeah, keep going. So supporters, Andrew Yang, rem remember him, our presidential can candidate. Uh, Senator Bob Hertzberg, who's been um, a big advocate of trying to arrive at consensus on privacy issues in the legislature. Um, Mr. McTaggart, of course, himself, and has support from the NAACP. Next slide. So this is what gets interesting. You have some, some liberal, what you'd call traditional liberal groups opposed to this, notably the ACLU and Consumer Federation of California. Um, of note to maybe for some of you, California Alliance for Retired Americans. Uh, and this also, you would think would have a lot of support, like, well, where are the tech companies? Where's the business community? They largely have stayed out of this. I think the tech industry right now doesn't feel like it's a great time for them to be in front of voters and spending tens of millions of dollars trying to protect their, their business model, even though they would have many quarrels with what this will do to them. Yeah, that's exactly right. Right, the Grand Tamale. Okay, bum, 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 bum. okay, 25 is a referendum as opposed to an initiative or something put on by the legislature. Um, in 2018, the legislature passed a law that abolished cash bail. And so the bail bond industry, of course, didn't like that. So they have bought the time for that law to be implementing by putting this on the ballot and hoping voters um, vote to uh, say no to the law that the legislature legislature passed. So don't get confused here. If you're voting yes, you're supporting the ban on cash bail. If you vote no, you want to keep things the way they were before the legislature passed the law. Um, we would be the first to ban cash bail. Um, and essentially it says, well, let's go to the argument slide. This gives a lot of discretion to the courts to decide when bail is going to be required. Um, the judge will have to decide whether this is a good thing, that there's a flight risk or the person is a danger to the community and then will decide. Um, this, uh, the, a lot of the groups opposed to this are the Black Lives Matter and other criminal justice groups who say this cash requirement is discriminatory against their folks. And uh, that's why they wanted to do away with it. Next slide. Uh, the opponents are largely from the bail bond industry. Um, they already say there's a built-in choice allowed in many cases by judges, and that it's gonna be very difficult to implement because there's an algorithm that the judge will use to help him decide or her decide whether the bail is gonna be required. Next slide. Um, again, more the liberal groups, but also some interesting uh, business groups are allied on the yes side. Our mayor, Daryl Steinberg, is on the yes side. Um, Karen Bass, a former speaker and vice presidential wannabe, also weighed in on this. Labor Fed, next slide. 
And a lot of the criminal justice folks that are in the business uh, and in law enforcement are opposed to this, as well as some of the taxpayer groups because of some of the increased costs, as well as the business group. And that's it for the next slide. Okay. If you are still shaking your head after this presentation, I completely understand. Uh, please use that ballot guide to, to help guide your decisions further. Uh, we'll be available uh, and we have maybe a time for a couple of questions, maybe not. Let's turn it over to our moderator to see. Uh, hang on. Okay, there we go. Well, yeah, there were a, a, a lot of questions. We got 552 people and over 34 questions. Um, Unfortunately, they're grouped more towards the, the first propositions. We had about nine questions on, on number um, proposition 14 and then another 12 questions on 15. Since 15 is kind of a biggie, um, and if you guys can open your Q&A, you might be able to scroll down and uh, see what I'm talking about after about the first 10 questions. See if I can get back up there. since we don't have a lot of time. Um, let's see, this is hard to try. We probably should have had people put in what number they were wanting to talk about at the first so we could find them easier. Um, let's see, where'd we go? Uh, on Proposition 15, will you comment that homeowners pay 70% of California property tax? It, I, I'm not sure we're being asked to confirm if that's true or not. Okay. I don't know that it is, although that would probably seem proportionally about somebody right. Is, well, somebody else is asking what percentage of sales tax and property tax comes from um, makes up the California income for the general fund, I think. Both should know that since we work for the governor, but I don't, unfortunately. Um, who put Proposition 15 on the ballot? Uh, that was, uh, was put on by signatures. It was largely funded by um, a union, unions out of Los Angeles. Okay. Um, proposition 16, somebody's asking, would it be harmful to Asian Americans? Like, I guess I would say there's a debate on that. There's Asian American groups in support and in opposition. Okay. Um, was there any early polling done on Proposition 18? You talked about early polling on some other propositions. I have not seen any polling on that. Okay. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not aware of polling on 18. Okay. And uh, I think we're probably out of time. We've got about two minutes left and we need to be wrapping it up here. So sorry to everybody who ate, gave such great questions, but we got a lot to cover and uh, just kind of ran out of time. I think we have to turn it back over to Chip. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, thanks, Rob and Steve, for such an informative and entertaining and most of all civil discussion. Uh, thanks to our members for their attendance and their interest in these important issues. Uh, next week, we'll have Dr. Francine Steinberg. She'll be talking about nutrition and health issues and insights. Thank you all for coming and remember to vote. Thank you all. See you next week.